Okay, so let's spend the next hour to talk about internal quality control in microbiological laboratories. So just to show you what are we going to talk about. So first is why we need to implement uh, the internal quality control in microbiological laboratories. Then I will explain a little bit what is about the quality assurance plan, how to prepare this internal quality control. And then I didn't talk with Roy before, but I organized the, the speak like the same. So with quantitative and qualitative method, meaning enumeration and detection methods to speak about uh, what is required for both types of methods. So also going back to validation and verification and um, about what is the regulatory referent that we can take for that. So again, we have the general um, standard on uh, requirements for competence of testing and calibration laboratories, so the ISO 70025. Then we can find in those in this standard that we have a point, the 7.7, the .7, then process requirements that we need to ensure the validity of the results and the standard, the ISO says, uh, the laboratory shall have a procedure for monitoring the validity of the results and this monitoring plan shall be planned and reviewed. But that's all. So we have nothing else about uh, how to do that, what to do and how to implement that in our lab. If we go specifically for the microbiological requirements, then we move to the 7218, that is the standard covering the general requirements and guidance on microbiological examinations. So here we have a point in the current standard, in the 2007 version, that is talking about the quality assurance of results and the quality control of performance. And in that uh, chapter we have a point on external, internal quality control. So here it's introduced what is the objective of internal quality control. So is to ensure the consistency in a day-to-day -day basis. And then also to check that the variability is under control. That's important to highlight that this is what is going to guarantee that we have in a day-to-day -day basis good and reliable results. So to continue with uh, Roy's uh, presentation, you have the validation that usually is performed by the manufacturer or by ISO. It's done once if the method is not changing. Then you need to verify your method in your laboratory to demonstrate that the method is working well. And you need to do that at the very beginning when you start to use the method. And that, uh, depending on the changes of the method, but if the method doesn't change and in the method it's the same, you need to do it once. It's a fixed picture of the method when you start to work on the method to demonstrate that you are able to start working on that method. And then the quality control is the next step. Is what is showing you that the method works well on a day-to-day -day basis with a different sample types, with a different people in your lab, with a different batches of culture media. So it's is that the idea on the quality assurance, um, the internal quality assurance of the method. So, unfortunately, we don't have a specific standard for quality assurance. We have only this general statement that is currently in the ISO standard, but nothing else. So, uh, it's, it's the same than a few years ago for the verification that we had something to do, but we don't know how to do it. Here, it's again the same. So, just to show you what is coming in the future. So, currently, the ISO 7. 218, it's under revision. Indeed, it's it's now um, under under vote. And then um, you can see if you are part of your uh, national standard body, you can vote until beginning of August. And now is draft international standard, meaning that technical changes can be done. So now is the moment to propose changes or to propose improvement to this new version of the standard that is coming. And with uh, this uh, standard, is going to be described a little bit more about internal quality control. So the standard already introduced some concepts like process controls, black samples, blank samples, positive and negative controls. Also, it's mentioning replicate testing, spike samples, and control charts. But it's only describing the what. So it's a general description 
and nothing else. So we are not going again to have a specific protocols, a specific criteria, a specific frequency to do all these tasks. So it's only again generating a general overview and again it's in the new standard to, to come, not core, not um, today is not yet available, it's under, under uh, development. Then we have also some other uh, requirements, very similar indeed, uh, the idea is to align 7218 with 8199, that is uh, the general requirements for water analysis, not only for food. And again, in this standard there is a chapter just describing that uh, you need to do uh, the monitoring and the control of the method performance and it's including the internal quality control, it's talking about process controls, replicate testing and spike samples, but again, nothing else. So it's not a strong base to develop your internal quality control. So the idea during this uh, presentation is to present uh, some of the experience that I have on that topic, some of the ideas that you can implement in your lab, but again, it's just a guideline, it's just uh, based on, on experience and is not based, and I want to be very clear, in any standard or in any official guidance. So it's nothing at ISO level and as far as I know uh, there is no uh, guidance recognized worldwide or recognized by national countries. Maybe there is one but as far as I know nothing is, is published. So if we move to explain, so if you are in an accredited lab or not, uh, independently of if you work under accreditation or not, for your results are impacted by a number of factors. So um, you can see that all of them can have an imp impact and a big influence on your results. For example, your facility or your premises, this, uh, the requirements for this specific factor are described in the ISO 718. Also for the equipment, the calibration, maintenance, verification of equipment is described in this standard, the 7218. And also the competence of the staff and the technicians working on the lab are described in this standard. On the other side, we have also the method. Of course, the method will impact on your results depending on the method that you selected. And already Roy uh, introduced what are the factors that you need to, to, to be sure that the, the, to, to evaluate, to be sure that your method is fit for purpose in your laboratory with your matrices and with your specific requirements. So basically methods are developed using the ISO 17648. Don't care about this ISO because, because it's only to develop reference ISO methods, but uh, when we are developing ISO methods we need to follow this standard. And also for alternative methods we have the ISO 6 16140 that I'm not going to, 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 to discuss again. For culture media and reagents, uh, again, if you change just the brand but not the recipe, not anything about the media, you also have the ISO 11133 that is describing how to do the performance, how to check the performance of culture media and reagents. And also, of course, the samples, and because that you need to do food item verification. Uh, are also <laughs> impacting your method and the sample preparation is described in the ISO 6887. So all those factors are important factors to have under control and in the respective standards you have criteria and you have some internal data showing uh, what is the requirements to have under control. So the internal quality control is something else. So it's indeed covering all these factors all together. So the EQC, the internal quality control, is trying to see the interactions and the global evaluation of all the factors together. Just to put you an example, imagine that you have in your food environment, in your factory, you have an ASAP system and you are controlling the temperature of your pasteurization. Okay, you have this control in your factory but you need to do something else. You need to do analytical test to verify that everything in your factory, the environmental factors, the pasteurization process, the raw material, all together is having a, a, a safe food at the end. Here, the internal quality control is trying to do the same. It's putting another layer of safety <coughs> in your results 
to confirm that all those factors are combined and are not impacting your results and are uh, producing reliable results. That's the objective of the internal quality control. So to put all together and to see what is finally the uh, reliability and the day-to-day -day results you can guarantee that are under control. Let's move to the <coughs> quality assurance plan. Then uh, this, again, uh, from now, no reference, no standard, just some ideas that you can use for your own lab. So the quality assurance plan should contain several steps. So first is the scope of the, of the plan. So you need to identify which methods, which technicians, food items, should be included in your plan. Usually, you can establish the systematic in one document, and then every year, usually in a year basis, you will review this document, and you can adapt this document considering new methods, new food items, because you are changing your, your um, analytics, or new technicians coming to your lab. So all that it's, uh, it's needs to be considered in your plan. Also, for the, for the quality assurance, you will need equipment and reagents. So you will need reference material, like a strains that you can buy in a culture collection, or you can buy reference material, uh, really certified really, uh, reference material ready to use. Or maybe you need other special equi equipment, not to do the analysis, but to prepare the samples. Sometimes you need special equipment to prepare the strains, or to be able to spike the strains or the food to do the quality control. Then it's important also to highlight the responsibilities, who do what. So usually you should have one person responsible to define the plan, but then you need one person in the lab, knowing the lab, knowing what is ongoing in a day-to-day -day basis to really be there, spike the samples, put the samples in your quality system, in your traceability system, and then follow all the samples within the, the test. I know that some labs, for example, are using a specific uh, marks or a specific identification for quality control samples. For example, putting in a red tag in the back or putting a specific uh, part of the incubator to avoid cross-contamination and to avoid uh, errors during the manipulation of those samples. So this is because that is important, not only the responsible for the plan, but also the person responsible to be sure that the samples are well managed in the lab in the day to day. And also, of course, the people doing the analysis needs to be uh, involved in that, in that plan. And then you need to define also the uh, controls that are you going to do. So who is going to do it, which is the frequency, how many controls are you going to include, and finally, of course, the acceptance criteria and the actions to be taken. Because you need to be ready to have results uh, under your control, but also results, results out of control. You need to be ready for that. You cannot wait until the, this result that usually is Friday afternoon when this result appears, and then you need to do something. So you need to be ready to, be, to implement actions in case that one of the results are out of control, are not under specifications. So this needs to be defined, defined up front. And also, of course, the acceptance criteria. I'm going to explain some case studies with some acceptance criteria, and, uh, but the acceptance criteria in this case should be adapted to your lab because it's your internal quality control plan. So in most of the cases, we cannot put a general threshold or a general value to confirm that your lab is working under control because it depends on many factors that are only applying to your own lab. The control levels in the quality assurance plan are three. One is the basics one, it's based on process controls. It's, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit what are uh, the different uh, description or definition of, of each. The second one, I put it in green, is the intra-laboratory. So uh, it's some tests that you are going to do only in your laboratory. And the third level that is in, in yellow, is the interlaboratory study. So 
the objective of this presentation is not to talk about interlaboratory study, <coughs> pardon, but to uh, introduce the first and the second uh, level. So let's go for each one of those levels. And again, I'm going to talk on the third level, interlaboratory, only once, only with this slide, and then I will stop to talk about interlaboratory or external quality assessment system that are uh, usually known. So this uh, external quality assessment is coming from organizations offering proficiency test samples. And first to select the proficiency test, you need to assess this organization in terms of what samples are providing, which frequency, which are the spiking levels, how many people is joining this interlaboratory trial, which methods could be excluded of the interlaboratory trial or not. So you need to assess all these before to pay, before to contract the uh, proficiency tests. And just to give you also some ideas, the external quality assessment should be performed according to standards. One is the 17043, that is for general requirements of interlaboratory organizations. And we have also one specific for food microbiology, that is the 22117, that are described the specific requirements for microbiological interlaboratory studies. In most of the cases, you can find an accredited uh, uh, proficiency test supplier. And this is also an extra guarantee that this uh, supplier is meeting those requirements. So then you don't need to spend uh, much, much time to evaluate all the statistics behind and so on. But if the lab, if the supplier of the proficiency test is not accredited, then again, you need to check that all the statistics, number of samples and, and, the, and all the aspects related are meeting your requirements. So let's go to the internal, so to the lab itself. What can you do to guarantee the reliability and the day-to-day -day results? So let's start by quantitative methods, enumeration methods. And I also would like, as if you remember, I put it at the very beginning, a slide showing six factors, the facilities, the people, uh, the methods, the, the culture media, and all those factors, and the equipment, all those factors are impacting the results. So first, you need always to confirm the prerequisites. So you need to confirm that the samples contains a good level, the number of the samples. Uh, you cannot ima imagine how many errors comes from mixing numbers from the samples if you don't have a good traceability system. Also the status, if the samples are well storage or not. So I can tell you also that some labs are only working with refrigerated samples and with a, when um, a stable sample is coming to the lab, a powder sample, for example, they always put it in the refrigerator always because it's just the way to proceed. And that's not good because you are changing the microflora on those samples. So uh, the prerequisites are covering all these aspects. Also the environmental conditions that you are working in a, in a good environment your incubators and the culture media it's correctly uh, established at good temperature sometimes and again i can see in a lot of labs the culture media not being in a good temperature because it's coming from the refrigerator you are uh, you need to start the analysis very quick and then it's not even at room temperature it's very cold and this is a strong stress for the bacteria so all those factors is important to uh, to control in a day-to-day -day. and also the weight and the volume tolerances. With automated systems, sometimes you don't need to be uh, to, to check every time, but you need to check at least once per, per day. So let's go for the process controls. F again, for we are talking about enumeration methods. So some of the controls that we can put in a process control are the sterility, the duplicates of the plates and the check of the dilution factor. What is a process control? It's something that we do in routine. We do at the same time that we are doing the tests. So we don't need to do extra work. We don't need to do anything else rather than to control what are we doing in routine. So it's uh, the first layer and it's again do it in parallel to your analysis. Let's go one by one. 
So the sterility blank, it's uh, as just the culture media or the reagents that are um, maintained in under sterility. And then you just need to take some of this media and go through the method with the media, including the incubation. And then you need to check that this uh, media is sterile at the end of the analysis. So if your media that is sterile contains um, colonies or it's not sterile, then you need to verify your environmental conditions, your culture media preparation, and then you cannot report your results. You need to check the impact on the results from this lack of sterility. A second control that you can do in routine is to check the duplicate of the plates. So if you are doing same dilution, two plates, again, same dilution, two plates, you can check the reliability of the duplicates and you can check also the heterogeneity on the microorganism dispersion and also maybe pipetting mistakes or not well manage the pipette. So to do that, you just need to count both plates because you are going to count both in any case to report the results. And then you can check the differences between the plates. So here you have two plates. You can check if the number of colonies for the plate on the left is or could be reliable compared when we ob when what you obtain on the right. So usually you have a rough idea about what is expected. So if one plate contains 10 and the other contains 100, you will say, well, that's not reliable. I made a mistake. I, I, it is a big difference. But then you can go down and you can say, what if I have 45 in one and 70 in another? Or what if I have 45 and 85? So what is the limit, the reliable limit that I can expect for those differences? So then you can find in the ISO 14461, it's an ISO that the scope is only milk and milk products, but at ISO level, we are considering to extend the scope and to, because you can use it and also in some ISO it's included as a reference. Then you can check the differences following this table. So I cannot put in one slide all the tables included in the, in the ISO, but I try to summarize in five by five uh, colonies the number of, of, of CFU that you can expect in duplicate plates. You have also the formula. But uh, just to give you an example, if I have in one plate uh, 72 uh, CFU, I can expect in the other having more, no more than 103 CFU. That's the range that you can expect to have a reliable count. So with this table, again, it's five by five, but in the original ISO is one by one. You can obtain the, uh, if your duplicates are reliable. You can check also in a process control your dilution factor. Here it's if you instead to do one single dilution two plates, you can do several dilutions if you want to extend the range of the enumeration. And then you have, according to the ISO, you can do only one plate per dilution. You can do two also, but uh, mandatory one plate per dilution, at least two dilutions. So here the idea is to see if we have reliability in the dilution factor if we are preparing correctly the sample, we don't have clumps on the sample or we don't have inhibitory effects because sometimes if the sample contains inhibitors, you can find that one concentrating dilution is having less bacteria than the other one because the inhibitor is still in a high concentration in the most concentration concentrated dilution. How to do that? Well, again, it's at the same time to report the result. You need to count both uh, plates and then you can estimate the differences between both and again here typically if you have in one plate uh, let's say 100 CFU in the next decimal dilution you should have 10 that's the normal but what happens if you have instead of 10 you have 20 25 or 40 then it's not easy to find the compromise to say the dilution factor is good or not so again, in that ISO, and I again summarize the table in five to five colonies, uh, just to put it in one slide, you can find what is acceptable in terms of dilution factor. Meaning that, for example, if you have in the minus one uh, 
uh, to do it simple 100 CFU. In the minus 2, you can expect from 3 to 19 colonies. If you have more or less than that, you are not mm, providing a reliable uh, dilution factor. And then you need to check and you need to evaluate what is happening before to report your result. Or again, if you take, for example, 45 in the, in the minus 2, then in the minus 3, you can expect between 1 and 11 CFU. So it's a range because theoretically it should be 4. If you have 45 in the second dilution, 4. So it's a range that, according to statistics, you can accept within this range. So again, this will help to you to report a reliable result and it's nothing else to do that to evaluate the data that you have from your plates. To facilitate this evaluation, uh, in the next ISO revision, it will be also published some tools, like uh, for verification, we uh, prepare some Excel tools. Here, it will be also uh, an Excel tool that is already validated and will be released uh, when, when the new ISO will be published. And looks like that, the Excel, so you can put the initial suspension, if it's 1 in 10, then the volume that are you plating, that can be 1 milliliter, for example, for pour plate or 0.1 for a spread plate. And then you need to put here the first dilution uh, that you are counting, for example, minus one. And you can put two plates per dilution or only one plate per dilution. The, the Excel works uh, with both. And also if you need to confirm. So the Excel will give you the final result on CFU per gram or milliliter. So it's giving you the result according the ISO formula, but also is helping you to see if you have uh, acceptable values within the parallel plates, within the dilution factor, and with uh, the second dilution. So all these values will be included in that Excel and will tell you yes, or if not, the Excel will tell you for example, in this case, that the difference in cones between plates uh, for the first dilution, 140 and 63, that's not acceptable. And then you need to evaluate. Maybe it's a mistake, maybe you counted some products that are not colonies. You need to evaluate those results. So mm, again, these are uh, controls that you can do in routine. And then the second level also for internal quality control are the use of control charts or spike samples to check reproducibility and accuracy. So for the control charts, you can use reference certified uh, material. I just put here an example from uh, a ready to use reference material that are coming from the NCTC Culture Collection, from the National Culture Collection in, in UK, uh, or from the Spanish Culture Collection, both are official culture collections, are providing the strains to guarantee the traceability and the, um, the, the status of the strain. And these strains are prepared in a lenticle that you can see here, that are ready to use. So it's taking 10 minutes to be dissolved, and then you will have a uh, known value ready to be enumerated. So with this reference material, you can prepare control charts. Again, I don't have time to go in detail for con control charts, but it's the objective is to keep the variability within the limits and check if your um, workflow is making deviations. So for the control charts, ideally you should plate between 50 and 100 CFU per plate. So uh, don't try to do a control chart with a very low limit with less than 10 colonies per plate because this could be not reliable. So try to do it with a uh, enough number of colonies on your plates. And then you need to establish the control and the warning limits and, and estimate the, the mean that will give you a bias. <coughs> Sorry. So here it's to uh, evaluate if your working day is going correctly. I cannot give you a frequency to do this control chart. Some people is doing daily control charts, so including a reference material every day. Some people is doing weekly. 
In some cases, monthly, but if you do it monthly, you can imagine that the deviation will be a long-term uh, decision. Maybe it passes several months until you detect a deviation and then you need to come back to all the results to take actions. Yes, if you want to implement that and you want to have more information about control charts, you can go to the, uh, there is a standard ISO in the standard for culture media. Uh, there is an annex in the 11133. There is an annex on control charts that it's the basics on control charts. You can use it. And also there is a Dutch standard, the NEN standard 6603. That is in English, in Dutch, of course, but it's uh, it's also in, in English, and you can buy this standard. It's applicable to chemistry and micro labs, so, but it's only on statistics. It's not saying you frequency or uh, how to implement in your lab, but it's more how to build the control charts and how to manage control charts. The second part of the quality control for enumeration methods is the intralaboratory with spike samples. Here, it's to control on a day-to-day -day basis the food matrix impact. It's a kind of food item verification, but instead to do it once, you do it in routine. And this helps also to confirm that your method works well with new matrices, because maybe you perform the verification today, but in a few days your company is changing the line of products produced, or is coming new raw materials, or if you are in a commercial lab, you are uh, working with a new customer, and then the, this study will allow you to check if your new next ma new matrices are reliable and are uh, working well with your methods and in your own conditions. Here again, the frequency can be from daily to at least once per month. I would not recommend to go more than once per month. And you can perform in parallel to the samples. In some laboratories, I know that you say, for example, you receive this kind of samples from raw milk cheese only in this period of the year. So then you can perform also the intralaboratory in parallel to those samples. Um, this uh, allows uh, to control the, the, the method. And I'm going to put just one example based on the ISO 121528 on enterobacteria CI enumeration, just to give you a flavor, but again, it's just a very, very uh, general example. How to establish control limits. So here you can start your control limits based on the validation data, like we, we did for the, um, for the food item verification. So you can start, sorry, for the um, uh, implementation verification. So you can start with the standard inter intralaboratory reproducibility coming from the validation, because when you start, you have nothing to paste. So that could be a first uh, starting. And then I took, for example, 0 0.57. And then from this value, you can establish the reproducibility and the accuracy. You can see on bold, I put two factors, but you need to check if these factors are applicable to your laboratory. I took it from a general uh, approach from the uh, control charts, but again, you need to check. So you can see that from statistics, you use 1.8 for food item, sorry, for sample um, implementation verification, you use two, the factor two here is 1.8, so it's very close meaning that for reproducibility, you can establish that your value will be 1.04 logs. And for accuracy, that could be um, comparable to the bias, I use here a factor that is uh, establishing the accuracy for a duplicate samples. If you do triplicates, it will be a lower uh, factor. And here it gives 1.37. I should say that this is a very high value. So you can start with that, but honestly, in my opinion, it's very high. So you can start also the accuracy or the bias with 0 0.5 that is coming from the verification, but this could be a general value. But again, I included this value because it's coming from statistics. So those values can be, again, help you to start to establish the control limits. Then you perform the analysis, so you take your sample, you divide in two parts, you spike with a reference value, for example, as we are going to control Enterobacteria CAE, uh, you can put E. coli at this level of CFU to be sure that you have enough number of colonies per plate. 
and then with different conditions you will obtain kind of this table with a reference value and two values obtained in condition A and condition B. You change it to a uh, log value and then you can estimate the reproducibility as the absolute value between A and B and you can estimate also the bias with the average of the two values compared with the reference value and then you obtain here two different values are acceptable or not well if you check with the values that we established before yes both are acceptable because are below the acceptability limits again this green criteria it's to start but then you need to do it by yourself so it's strongly recommended that you establish your own criteria in your own lab to be sure that your own variability is under control and then there are as again at statistics you can use it to establish your own uh, criteria and your own values and the end if you are out of these land values you need to conduct a road cost analysis study and maybe you need to implement preventive or corrective measures like improving the sample preparation because maybe this food item is not fitting with your standard sample preparation protocol because maybe it's impacting print uh, the, the enumeration or it's not well homogenized. With that, uh, I finished the quantitative methods and let's start with the qualitative methods. <coughs> Again, qualitative is detected, not detected. And same prerequisites. Again, you need to check that everything before you start, you do your test, is under control. <coughs> And then you move to, again, level one and level two. Remember that the external quality assessment is not part of the, of the presentation. So the process controls can be sterility and a positive control. Let's go one by one. And you can see that is something similar that we, I explained for the quantitative methods. So for the sterility test, the blank is to check the cross-contamination, hygienic conditions, to check that everything went well during the analysis. And it's just to, to use an sterile sample. Uh, just Some people I know is using sterile water, just for example, putting 25 milliliters of sterile water. Some people is just taking the pre-enrichment broth and using the pre-enrichment broth uh, with no sterile water through all the process. For me, both are acceptable. And you need to do that usually daily some people is doing after every run it depends in your lab it's working in shifts and you have a lot of people and you have several runs maybe it's good to put several runs with every batch that you are uh, working some other people is doing uh, a daily control once per day usually at the end of the day to be sure that all that you process is under sterility and then the actions it's if you suspect that this uh, has an impact on your results, you need to stop. And then in some cases may be acceptable if your samples are negative. So imagine that you are analyzing salmonella, your sterility is containing some colonies or some turbidity, but all your samples salmonella are negative. Okay, you can release the results, but in any case, you need to do some actions because you have a contamination in your media or in your workflow. So you need to, to understand what is happening. The second control is the positive control. It's to assess the correct manipulation and detection of the target. So here you need to use a, a, a reference material again. You need to spike with salmonella or with listeria, depending on, your, on what are you analyzing. And in this case, you replace the original sample by the target bacteria. Here it's recommended to use a low concentration so you I also remember some laboratories spiking 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. That is a high risk of cross contamination, sec first, and second, is not really challenging the method. It's very high. You don't need pre enrichment if you have 10 to the 6. You, can, you will detect it uh, immediately. So, ideally, you need to go for low, and what is low usually is below 10 and recommended between 3 and 5 CFU per sample. So, that's recommended because it's enough above of the limit of detection 50 so usually limit of detection 50 is around 0 0.7 0 0.71 0 
So three to five, you should have a positive result, and but it's not so high to not challenge the method. Uh, ideally, this process control can be performed every run or day. Some people is doing weekly, some changing to monthly. That depends on on your on your uh, internal quality control plan, and of course the criteria is this needs to be detected. Um, for some methods can be replaced by the intra-laboratory study that I'm going to explain later on. Let me put an example, and the example is a little bit more extensive, includes those controls, but some something else, and is about the uh, real-time PCR method. So this is a, a, a method, this is the, the Merck method for detection of uh, pathogens. In this case, for Salmonella real-time PCR, uh, the name is called uh, Asurans GDS Salmonella. And the method includes, of course, a pre-enrichment. Uh, could be short, uh, eight hours enrichment, or could be 18 hours. And then a manual or an automated protocol not to do DNA extraction, but to do an immunomagnetic separation. So the first step is you capture your bacteria, you clean your sample, and then you go with live bacteria into the real-time PCR, that is the step three. And in a close environment, you have the DNA extraction and the amplification and detection of the target. If you want more information, I think there is a link now in the chat, so just click there. I'm not going to spend more time to explain the method, or you can contact John. Uh, and I'm, hap I'm sure that John will be happy to, to present you the, the method. If you're based in the UK or Ireland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's go for the controls. So if you implement a PCR method, for example, you need to have a negative control that is DNA free water or sterile DNA without PCR inhibitions and you need to include it in every PCR run. This, of course, needs to be negative. Those are examples or negative and extraction controls that you put this uh, uh, free the sterile DNA free water and then you should have negative results for your tests. The other control for PCR specific is a PCR positive control that is to show that you are manipulating correctly the sample and the performance with your target is correct. So it's again needs to be done with the target. So if you are running salmonella, you need to put a positive control for salmonella. If you are doing listeria, you need to put a positive control for listeria. So uh, here you need to perform at every PCR run and the concentration can be, I put it 10 to the 3 because again it's challenging for the PCR but should be enough to be detected. And uh, the result must be detected for this run. You can use for the GDS specifically, you can use uh, just live samples or you can use a plasmid that is uh, just DNA. So this is how it looks like a positive control with test samples with, uh, in this case, was with uh, bacteria, with live bacteria. And then for PCR again, you need to use an internal amplification control. And this is in every tube. It's not once per run, but every single tube must have this control that includes DNA and a specific primer and probes to be detected. And then you need to have this result positive because if not, inhibitions occurs during the PCR and you cannot report the results. So this is just some examples how it looks like the uh, internal control in a standard uh, PCR system. And to finalize with the qualitative methods, Let's go for the intralaboratory study. Here it's simple compared with uh, enumeration because here we just go for detection, yes, no. So here you can use spike samples and you need to check the method performance. Here is not only the PCR, for example, you are checking all the samples from the very beginning. You are checking the enrichment, you are checking the detection and the confirmatory steps. How are you going to do that? Here, you need to spike uh, samples close to the limit of detection. Again, from three to five in a standard method. In some cases, for example, for Campylobacter, sometimes the limit is higher or for Legionella. And then instead to go three to five, maybe you can go for maximum nine times limit of detection of the validated method. So this, you need to play with your method and define your uh, spiking level. You can do it daily and 
I would say no more than uh, monthly, so because you need to have enough data. And again, the result expected is uh, detected. So for example, here, uh, you can use a pizza. If you receive pizza in your lab, of course, needs to be samples that you are analyzing in routine. And then you can use certificate of analysis. Here you have the um, reference material that this material is certified but an, by a, an accreditation body. And it's too small, but you can see that this reference material is guaranteed that it's 72 CFU per disk. So then you can dilute this disk in 20 milliliters, is diluted in 10 minutes, and from this 20 milliliter suspension, you can take one milliliter and put it in your initial suspension. This guarantees you that you will have 3.6 CFU per sample, and you are spiking at low level. And then you run the method. You do the enrichment, you do the detection, and if needed, you do the confirmatory tests. And then with that, you can guarantee that your sample is working well with your method uh, during your own conditions in your lab. Again, some examples about uh, how it looks like. For example, here on the left, you have a feed spike sample because uh, this was a special feed for, uh, for some um, cattle. And you can see the, the, the positive result, the CT. And on the right, you have a swab, an environmental sample, again, spiked, because in some cases, swab can contain neutralizers that sometimes are impacting the, the sample recovery. So those are two examples of uh, spike sample to control your process. Uh, in some cases, it's mentioned also that the need to include a negative process control. Negative process control is a sample spike with a bacteria that is not the target bacteria. Imagine that you are doing salmonella analysis detection and then you are spiking your sample with E. coli. This is a negative process control. You spike something and you expect to have a negative result. Honestly, my personal opinion, it's very limited the uh, result and the value, the added value that you are going to obtain with that because if you spike with the negative result, once you know the result will be always negative. But you can implement that in some cases for corrective actions or if you want to train a new uh, technician or if you have something to evaluate on your method. So you can include this negative process control, but in my opinion, not in a routine basis. To finalize, the conclusions, just two slides. For the quality assurance plan, you need first to check your prerequisites to check that, again, these six factors that I explained at the very beginning, environmental conditions, technicians, culture media, the method, the samples itself, and the equipment are under control. Then you need to establish a balance between the three control levels. Remember, the first is the process control that you do in routine at the same time that you do the analysis. The second level is the intralaboratory study, usually with the spike samples. And the third level is the external quality assurance. So your plan should contain a good balance between all those controls to be sure that you have a good uh, result. And then you need to be very strong on the results evaluation, the root cause analysis and the actions that you need to predefine what are going to be the actions that you will take. So Remember that the internal quality control guarantees the day-to-day -day validity of your microbiological results and is something to continue after the verification. And that's all from my side, so I don't know if we <coughs> have questions. We do uh, have one question to begin with uh, from Sipa Mandler, and I do apologize if I've mispronounced that. Um, is there a need for a positive control for a quantitative method? Yeah, so the positive control for quantitative method that you can use, it's if you use reference certified material, you will have the value. I show you in the, in the text. An unknown value. Unknown value, and, and then that's all. You need to believe that this value is, is true. <laughs> okay, and then you check, please check the certificate because sometimes, depending on the material, you need to resuspend in one buffer or in another, so you need to manipulate correctly. If not, of course, you can prepare by yourself. 
just go for a culture collection, an official culture collection, or use your own internal isolated strains. But in this case, you need to characterize very well your strain. Then you grow your strain, and then you can prepare your suspension to be spiked. Just as a reference, in the ISO, it's not for quality control. I repeat, it's not for quality control, but in the ISO 16140 part 3, you can have graphics and uh, explain how to prepare a suspension with a concentration known. And this can help also for quality control, because at the end it's the same. Perfect. Thank you. Um, no more questions uh, in the chat box at the moment. Uh, anything in the room? I'll use this one. If people have more questions, my email is there, so they can send me. Um, I don't know if it's in the scope, but what about the human factor? Because the performance of technicians may also vary. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with um, interlaboratory samples? Do you tell them that these are to be treated specifically correctly? Well, it's good. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, indeed, uh, I included, for example, for reproducibility to do twice, and uh, ideally with different people to compare people, people between, between them. Um, internal quality control is not to qualify people, but you can use the same criteria to qualify people, because if you have a new technician for summer, for example, and so on, you can have the quality control criteria and you can introduce another quality control uh, for this technician to compare. And third, in terms of, of um, what should be... Um, um, compare uh, what can you do to, to compare technicians it's in, in my opinion you need to establish a specific uh, quality control plan for a new technician so you can compare but usually you need to do that uh, to have enough data to demonstrate that this technician is able to perform reliable results so that, that's for me the, the the point i don't know if this cover what do you communicate? I remember from uh, oh, yeah, inter interlaboratory tests yeah. that one technician was so nervous about yeah. it <laughs> yeah. that she messed <laughs> up. Uh, yeah. The other thing can also be true yeah. that people do it perfectly, but only for this purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's right. So when I work it, uh, and I recommend, is to do blind and double blind samples. What is a blind sample? Is a sample that you know that is a quality control, but you don't know the result, but you know that you are passing a test. On the other side, there are uh, other uh, double blind that you don't know that you are doing a control. And this is a good sample, not only for your lab, but also to qualify other labs, to send double blind samples that you know what is inside, but the people doesn't know that they are under uh, scrutinized and they're under a test. To do that, for example, and it's good, uh, the, the vitroids, the reference material that I showed you, it's possible to buy negative also, because if people see that you are putting a lenticle, you are waiting for a result. You are waiting for a positive. Mm -hmm. So we have blank samples that you can put it, and then the result will be negative. It's exactly the same, but people will not know if it's positive or negative. This helps also to, to, to check if people it's... But yeah, the fact that the people is it's important, and yeah, people can be very nervous uh, doing the yeah. test, yeah. Okay. So I think... Um, a final question. Uh, so we can keep on time, David. Um, how many of the controls do we need to conduct to consider that there's no breakdown in the lab? Uh, I would say for, <laughs> for enumeration, always, because for the process control, at least, I would say do it always. Because you are doing plating cones, and if you have positive samples, do it always. Don't release a result that is not under the dilution factor or the duplicate factor that you expect. That's for me a routine that you need to implement. For the others, depend on how big is your lab, which kind of samples are you receiving. I would say if you are receiving a very complicated samples every week and are different, I would say daily or weekly basis, you need to implement an intra-laboratory study to test if your samples are, f if your method is fit for purpose for those samples. Mm. If you are always analyzing, I know that some labs, daily labs, are only working with one or two type of matrices, same supplier, same concentration, always the same, then you can relax, I would say, <laughs> your control, and then you can have another control. And also depending on the method, if it's a flow cytometry method, you need to implement other controls to guarantee that your equipment is reliable. 
if it's a manual counting or a microscopy, it's different. So, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give a gold uh, yeah. rule, but I uh, depending on your method, you need to establish this plan. It's quite dependent on, on unfortunately, the circumstances. Yes, and yeah. because that I think there is no ISO or not big guidance because it's, it's not easy to establish a general uh, guidance. Yeah. Okay. Um, David, thank you very much. You're welcome.